Okay, so are there questions until now? Regarding this uh, strange uh, technique. So I will try to recollect a little bit. So the basic idea here is that uh, we want to compare two types and see if u if t derives from u okay so this is a relationship of uh, inheritance to check the relationship of inheritance we are going to use the fact that c++ can test conversion when passing arguments to function and the fact that sides of does not actually call any function and is just going to test the possibility of calling the function so we are going to test if these two sides of are the same and the second one is what we expect and the first one is what we want to check so make t is used to build an element of type t then this element is passed to a test function. So the compiler has to check if the first or the second must be called. It will call the first one if it can convert t into u. It will call the second one if it cannot convert t into u. So this, of course, is going to be the same, so true, if test u is called so if we can convert t into u so at the end it's not so difficult it's only that arriving here is a little bit involved of course i will never ask you to do things like that okay but anyway i believe that studying how it works gives you a lot of information on how c++ works so for example the fact the size of is not actually calling the function the fact that you don't need to provide the implementation of this function at all because they will never be called by anybody the fact that uh, this is a way of passing any kind of type to the function test and the fact that this is called only if t can be converted to u and so on and so forth so there is a lot of information on the C++ language on this code. So even if you never use conversion, it's from a didactic point of view, from a uh, uh, learning point of view, you learn a lot of things by, just by looking at this technique. Okay, so the last step is to uh, define as in the previous code an additional enum value same type and provide the following specialization so when only one t is passed not two but just one then exist is true and same type is true otherwise we write exist and then same same type is false okay so we are going to do the following uh, define a macro super subclass t u which is going to be if a conversion between u star and t star exists and does not exist a conversion between t star and void star and so sorry and t star and void star are not the same type then t derives from u Okay, sorry, u derives from t. So t is a super class of u. So super subclass means super subclass. So if u can be converted into t, so if u star can be converted into t star, and if t star is not the same as void star because anything can be converted to the void star, then a conversion exists. And super subclass strict t u is if exists a, a, a if t is a superclass of uh, u and does not exist a conversion between u star and t star then uh, so and u star and t star are not the same type then the uh, the, the relationship is a strict okay so this two macro will tell us if t is a superclass of u 
and if t is a superclass of u in a strict sense so uh, it's going also to check that t is different from u okay so not very difficult at the end uh, after you understand all the different steps it's like building uh, over and over okay okay i'm going to skip the list of types uh, and i'm going to concentrate instead on c plus plus 11 and templates uh, so um, the new standard provides support for uh, what is called a variadic templates what is a variadic template variadic template is a template of uh, an unspecified number of arguments okay and these are called also type list because are lists of type okay so variadic template is a class which takes a variable number of template arguments and this uh, is used rarely fortunately because it's not very easy to understand what is it uh, but uh, can be used in some cases for example uh, inheritance in post based for example you can write a class variadic template which derives from a number of blaze class which is unspecified and uh, the constructor is going to take a number of arguments uh, one for each base class and pass them to the base classes so this is a very strange way of writing this, but um, it's quite useful. For example, let me see if I find an example of where I used this. So basically, um, I wrote a, a, a little library for uh, mm, specifying uh, uh, mm, scheduling algorithm and schedulability analysis. Now you don't need to know what is a schedulability analysis. What you need to know is that usually in this, um, in this uh, analysis, you have the concept of task which is not always well defined so basically you have several kinds of tasks you can have a task which can be a periodic task in that case it's going to be to have a period uh, or a periodic task can also have uh, an offset or uh, this can be also uh, a task uh, that uses resources and uh, it can also be for example a multi-frame task In this case, it's going to be a list of frames. And you can also have uh, any combination of this. For example, you could have a periodic task, which is also multi-frame. Or you can have a task with resources, which is also periodic with offset. So you can have any combination of these things. So how to implement this is not very easy. The first try is to have class which is called task which has the basic properties and then derive from this okay 
So for example, you could derive a task with period. And then you could derive a task with offset. Okay, and so on and so forth. But then if you need a periodic task with offset, then you have to write still another class. Okay, so you are going to have a lot of combinations and the complexity explodes pretty soon. And also, it's not very easy, easy to duplicate. There is a lot of duplicated code. For example, here there is a, a function get offset, but then you have to rewrite the same function here. And here you have a get period, but then you have to rewrite the same function here. A different approach, uh, so we have already seen this, remember when we did the bridge pattern. Remember, there was, uh, you know, several uh, ways of expanding and not very easy to understand. But of course here we are in a different setting because we don't have an implementation on one side and another implementation on the other side we want to do the bridge. We just have a sort of, a sort of several properties and it's not very easy to combine all of them. And of course we also want to have types. So another requirement is support for types. It means that I have an algorithm for doing analysis. Uh, analyze, and this algorithm, uh, I have two versions, one for synchronous tasks, that, I that means task, task periodic, with offset and then you have uh, a synchronous task no offset so depending if I have an offset or not I want to call uh, one analyze function or another analyze function so I want to do that based on types and now uh, here I have uh, uh, it's difficult for me because I want to uh, I want to check the type, so I want to call the function if I'm here or if I'm there. But as you can see, I have two two different types here, so it's not very easy to understand how to do this. So another completely different technique is to revert the hierarchy, and actually have uh, uh, go the other way around. So I'm going to have again a task. with the basic property, okay? Then I'm going to have another task, which I call task X. Which derives from here. Okay, but it's also deriving from a type list. It is a list of types. It can be several types. And each one of this type is a class that implements one specific property. For example, as offset, as resources, and uh, what else? As frames. 
and I can decide which one of these task X is going to implement. So I'm going to write code like this. This would be a periodic task with offsets. Or I'm going to write task X. Of course, this is T1. And I'm going to write task offset uh, as res as frames. Okay. So what happens is that this class, task X as res as frames, derives from as res and as frames and tasks. And so it's a type that derives from all of them. And uh, T1 instead derives only from task and from this. So my analyze function now can take either as offset, and in that case is going to implement the analysis with offset, or a simple task, in that case is going to take the analysis to not offset, and one of the two functions is going to be called. How do I write this? So this is the, the general task, which has uh, uh, a few basic things like the worst case execution time, the deadline, and so on. In this case also the offset. And then I'm going to write task x, so offset was probably not the, the, the right the right sample, sorry. Uh, and then I'm going to write this. So it's a template of several properties. So this derives from task and from the properties. And this can be many. So this dot 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 means that I can have several types here. And this is going to derive from them all. Okay, and of course, when I do the construction, I should call the constructor all of this implicitly, and the same is going to happen here, and the same is going to happen there. So everything is going going to work as expected. Okay, so this was one way of implementing, uh, of using uh, the the variadic templates. Uh, another example that maybe you cannot see here it because it's uh, a little bit too, too small, maybe, it's how to implement a type, sa ta type safe printf. You find the same example on Wikipedia, so we are going to open, open that. Uh, so I can enlarge characters here. And uh, here we go. So basically, uh, we are going to implement a printf which it just takes a string and is going to check for the presence of this. And if it finds it, then it runs a runtime error, invalid format string, because I found this without any argument. And then it's going to have the most generic version which takes a string, a value, and many arguments okay and the idea is that uh, we are going to expand on this mm -hmm, by using recursion so basically we go through the different characters of the string if we found this and this is not followed by this okay then what we do is we are going to print the value and on the output and we are going to call the printf starting from the next character and passing the remaining arguments because this has already been consumed okay and uh, of course if we don't find any of these we have to print the content okay and uh, if we go out of this and uh, without uh, returning, then we have a logic error. There is an extra argument provided to printf. That means we found a value, but without the corresponding uh, uh, percent uh, string here. So basically, what can we, can we write? 
let's add a stupid thing okay let's go here Okay, we could write things like uh, Okay, in this case the print is going to call which of the two functions So I have a string and an integer so I have two versions, the first one only takes a string, the second one takes uh, a value and a variable number of arguments which can all, only uh, also be zero, okay? So I can also have zero arguments here. So basically it's going to call this. So this will go through the string and basically since at the beginning it doesn't find this, it will just print the character, okay? So this will print all characters until it finds this symbol. When it finds this symbol, since the following is not another one of these, what it does is calls printf by passing the next character, which is going to be uh, a zero, and the following arguments, which is going to be again zero. So this one is called by passing zero, while s finishes immediately, so we return, and we return from here, and so basically this is going to print, this is an integer five, okay? Now, if you want to print something else, for example, an object of type, uh, I don't know, my class, which of course is something you can print, then you write, So this is of course is going to work well because it goes through and checks that the number of uh, this element is the same as the number of arguments. So as an exercise, try to write a program which tests this function. Okay, so you find it on Wikipedia. Another mm, thing based on variadic templates are tuples. A tuple is a sequence of objects of different types. For example, you can define a tuple sorry, to be a sequence of integer, string, and a vector of integers. And you call this object T. So this is a strange object which has three fields. The first one is an integer, the second one is a string, and the third one is a vector of integers. And you can access elements by using this function. Uh, I sh uh, sorry, I should pass T here. So the, I have an error here, sorry. I should write T, T, T here. So standard get 0 T is equal to 42. So I'm assigning 42 to the first element. Standard get 1 of T is Giuseppe. So the string is assigned my name. And standard get 2 of uh, T is 1, 2, 3. So it's uh, a vector with three integers. And then you can also, of course, use it by printing. So this is, should be standard get zero of t again, sorry, for all these mistakes. I'm going to correct soon. Okay, so I also have an example in which I use this, and this is called the two tuple. And uh, I have the usual class I use for my examples, and this class has just a constructor and a destructor and uh, takes an argument x and stores it and uh, uh, you have a function get to get it and then I define a tuple t with auto as a make tuple with these elements a pair string string a string 
and a my class. And the initialization is Mike Payer Doug Douglas Adams. This is the most famous book, HRS Guide to Galaxy, and 42, which is the famous number in the book. And uh, I'm going to print it by using a Cout title, author, and answer to the meaning of all is 42. Okay? And uh, notice that uh, with get I access the member and then I can do whatever I want. For example, with get I access the second member, which is a class, my class, which has a function get, and so I do get. And when I do get zero, I have a pair which has two fields, first and second, and I access them. Okay, so let's compile it. So, constructor of my class, the structure of my class, because I'm creating and destroying an element of type 42 for passing to the constructor, then the title, the author, and the answer to the meaning of all is 42. And then the object is destroyed when I destroy the tuple. Okay? And uh, as you can see, I mean, this is a, a short way of making a small class. In the old C++ standard, I would uh, have to write a class. I would have to write something like struct my tuple and uh, and then say something like uh, I don't know pair of uh, string uh, string and uh, and then string name class uh, object okay and then I would like I would have to use this uh, in the program and instead by doing this I'm uh, sort of uh, automatically defining a class like this okay and uh, the important nice thing is that it, since it uses a variadic templates uh, you can pass as many arguments as you want in the tuple and so you can have a tuple with uh, 15 arguments of uh, 25 arguments, it doesn't matter. You can actually create very complex structures using this tuple. And the nice thing is that you can do that without writing a class. So, nice. The last thing we are going to do today is the uh, template, which is called the Curiously recur Recursive Template Pattern. And this is a very simple pattern in C++ that can be used in some practical situation when a, a virtual function cannot be used or we don't want to use virtual functions, okay? So the basic pattern is very simple, although it's a little bit uh, uh, crippled. So basically you have a base class, which is a template of uh, X, and then you have derived, which derives from based, and you pass derived as parameter to base. So basically, the base class has a template, which is the derived class. So this is why it's called curiously recursive template pattern, because you pass derived as a template of base. Now, there is a restriction in doing this, of course, the sides of base cannot depend on the parameter x. So x should not influence the number of bytes of which base consists of. Okay? For example, you can, cannot instantiate an object of type x inside base, otherwise it's going to recurse forever. But you can use x inside base and we will see how. So one very simple use of this pattern is to count the number of instances of a class. Uh, suppose you want to count the number of instances of a class. As you can know, you can write uh, uh, a simple counter class. And 
the simple counter class um, uh, all it has to do is to have a static member which is an integer for example c that you are going to initialize somewhere like here And then every time you create an object of type counter, you have to increase the counter. And every time, uh, and then of course you can read this counter. Okay. In this way, you basically, every time you create a class, c is incremented and then at some point you can get the number of elements that have been created until now okay so if you want to generalize this you can have class a public counter okay and so basically every time you create uh, uh, an element of class a the counter is going to be incremented okay and so basically you count the number of elements of A. But if you want to do something different, for example, you want to count also the number of elements of B. Now, the counter is only one, and it's going to be incremented either when you call a bot since uh, when you call um, a constructor of A and when you call a constructor of B. So basically the counter does not distinguish between A and B. You are going to count everything. Okay. So the solution to this is to put this technique inside each every class. But then of course this is a repetition of code, blah 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 blah. So we don't want to repeat code. So how can we have a counter for each class? in a generic way. So we want to have a counter for each single class. Well, the idea is that we could have this counter to be a template class. For example, this template class could be on a value, v. And then this value is not used inside counter, actually. And then you could say counter of 0, counter of now, of course, you have to generalize the concept here. Okay? And initialize everything. Uh, however, uh, okay, so the, and now it's okay because you are going to have counter uh, zero and counter one to be two different types. And since there are two different types, you are going to have two counters, one for counter 0 and one for counter 1. And so now you have two counters, one for class A and one for class B. And you can call them independently. Okay? However, this is a little bit uh, stupid because we are not going uh, to check that the numbers are all different, right? If somebody says in another completely different uh, file. Then B and C are going to share the counter, which is something which don't want, we don't want. So to generalize this, we could do something like this. So first of all, we generalize, instead of integer, we just put uh, a type name. Notice that we don't use x inside because we don't care. And then here we are going to pay, put the name of the, the... Okay? So now we are going to have uh, one different counter for every class, uh, and this is automatic, and, uh, and everything is going to work fine. So this is uh, the, rec the uh, curiously recursive template pattern because we have a base class which depends on a template, which is the derived class. 
So this is uh, very simple. And again, you have an example of application here. Another technique is how to simulate virtual functions by using this template pattern. So the idea is uh, um, that sometimes we don't want to use virtual functions because virtual function, they bring a little bit of overhead. And also if you look at, uh, for example, embedded systems, sometimes uh, we don't want to completely avoid the use of dynamic memory, the use of pointers, and the use of virtual functions. Anyway, some of the things that we do with virtual function are very, very useful. So can we um, simulate virtual function by using something which is not actually virtual function? Well, yes, we can, and we are going to use the CRTP pattern for this. So these are, as an example of uh, base and derived class, uh, which use the virtual functions. So look at that. We have a base class uh, with three functions, f, g, and h, and three virtual, f uh, and three implementation functions, implf, implg, and implf, and implh. And uh, f is going to call, to call implf, and g is going to call implg, and h is going to call int h. And the first two are virtual, the last one is not. And then you have class derived, which derives from base, and re-implements, so it makes an overload, an override, sorry, of function int f and of function int h. Okay? And now you have an object of type derived, and you are going to call f, g and h. Now when you call f, you are going to call this. And since int f is a uh, virtual function, the one provided by derive is going to be used. So by calling f, you end up calling int f. And for g, instead, since int g has not been overload, override, the, then this one is going to be called correctly. And finally, for h, since impl h is not virtual, this one is going to be called. Okay? So this is for virtual function at the beginning of the course, I hope you remember. Now, how can we do this without writing virtual here? And so without using virtual functions? Well, we can do this by using the curiously recurring template pattern. So the idea is that you have a base class which is templatized with the derived class. And f, instead of just calling implf, is going to, for, to do a static cast of this into t star. And then on this pointer is going to call implf. So what this do does is quite simple. When we have class derived, which derives from base derived, and we call xf, this function is called on object of type x. So this pointer is actually a pointer to this object, right? To a derived object. So we are going to do a static cast Okay, to derive the star, and this of course is going to work because the object is actually derived. And then we are going to call implf, and so this one is going to be called derived implf. Okay, for g, what happens for g? So we are going to do a static cast of this into derived star. And then we call implg. But since implg has not been overridden, it inherits the implg by base, so this one is going to be called. And finally, when we call h, we just call h, because h was not virtual in the previous example, and so we don't do the static cast in front. So the behavior is going to be the same. 
in the previous case we are going to have printed derived imp base imp g base imp h and here we are going to have derived imp f base imp g base imp h and of course i have the example for you here okay so this is the simulation of a derived so it's the same code you have seen we are going to make and call it and this is the printing derived base as expected okay so we simulated the use of virtual functions by using this static cast Uh, when this is useful, of course, um, this technique is not so general after all, because uh, a virtual function cannot be entirely substituted. Because in the previous example, the binding is a static, because it's made by the compiler. If you need a real dynamic binding, you cannot escape a virtual function. So, for example, if you have something like this, derived a x, derived b y, base r which is going to point either to x or y depending on something which is decided dynamically when we do rf we are going to have a big mistake and actually this cannot be done because base is templatized so there is no base in the uh, curiously recurring template pattern but you have to specify base derived a or base derived b but then if you specify you cannot decide that dynamic uh, at runtime so these kind of things cannot be done okay but still sometimes it's still useful because uh, uh, in embedded systems uh, you may actually know all object at compile time you want to avoid the overhead of using uh, uh, runtime type identification and dynamic binding and we still want to be flexible in using inheritance and the ability to choose the implementation at compile time without uh, redo the programming and the coding. So without actually changing the code, okay? Oh, another uh, stupid example is uh, uh, when you want to, for example, clone objects. Remember we did, that we said that when you have a polymorphic object, sometimes it's good to have a clone function, okay? Which is virtual. And now the clone has to be re-implemented in every single derived class from shape by simply uh, returning a new object. So for example, the clone of triangle will return a new triangle. The clone of rectangle will return a new rectangle. The clone of square will return a new square. The clone of circle will return a new circle. So I think you, you understood there is a pattern here. So the technique now is to have an intermediate class we call shape CRTP, which has a template which uh, derives from here. So, sorry, this should not be virtual, of course. And, uh, and this one returns a derived, okay? And then square, instead of deriving from shape, derives from shape CRTP square. And circle instead of deriving from shape, derive some shape CRTP circle. So this function is customized to the actual uh, type. And so you don't need to write a clone for every single object because it has already been once and for all here for everybody. Okay, so that was the last slide for today. So next time we are going to uh, analyze the the assignment a little bit so let me remind you the assignment and in particular I'm going to describe uh, um, this is simulation of library medicine a little bit more in detail okay and we are going to look at the code and how to implement things and then we are also going to discuss on how we can start uh, uh, modeling the system okay and do the simulation 
and uh, what is left in the next lecture so uh, we actually have uh, um, three more lectures and uh, so we are going to work on the project together and we are also doing uh, going to do a little bit of uh, wrap up and a little bit of software engineering uh, uh, and so how to uh, organize the work of the programmer in a large project okay do you have any questions so I guess this is a no so thank you and uh, I'm going to actually give you the results of the second assignment early next week okay so thank you very much see you on Friday bye bye